picture the following scenario. The Texas Border Patrol manages to apprehend someone that, let's say, has an international warrant. And they're not from the United States. They're not an American citizen. What do they do with that person? Uh, Well, they would push him back over the border. But the thing is, you need to have consent from Mexico. And what if Mexico doesn't give that consent? Now, you may say, well, America can pressure Mexico. Yeah, it can. But, like, is Joe Biden going to do it? Are the Democrats going to do it? Right? So, uh, this isn't the case where you have someone with the international word. But what if you just have someone with no documents whatsoever? And they're in America right now. They're not a citizen. Where do you send them back? Right? Uh, Now, all of this, apparently, can be solved if the United States agrees to some of the Mexican president's proposal for stemming immigration. And this was him discussing it during the 60 Minutes interview. And and he's a very funny guy. The first one is that the U.S. needs to give $20 billion a year to poor countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. I, I wonder if Mexico considers itself to be one of these recipients. Uh, but, but this is what I would like to call trickle-down foreign aid where it's not going to help with the income disparity at all. Because you notice what happens when you send uh, foreign aid to poor nation. It's usually the ruling class of those nations that pocket all of the aid. It doesn't actually go down to the impoverished. Um, And you're also messing with their economy. I mean, Europe and China and even Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been messing with Africa nation's economy for the last couple of decades. The thing is, like, when you give them foreign aid, especially if you give them free food, well, they do have farmers, believe it or not, right? So, so now the farmers have to compete with free, and you can see why that would be a problem. You, like, you're disincentivizing them to create their own farming industry, and you're making them reliant on your foreign aid. You, you can never compete with free. It's, it's impossible, right? So the farmer does need to invest money into his fields, into his crops, into uh, security, making sure that no one is stealing or destroying the farms or whatever. Um, And and then the transportation to the supermarkets. Meanwhile, you have another product that's coming in that's free. I mean, just so you can understand, in Europe, we we had the farmers protesting here in, in Romania because the Ukrainian farmers are selling grain on our market. And the difference is that our farmers have to abide by European commissions and by European legislation, which makes farming much more expensive and and cost-consuming than it is for the Ukrainians. So they're basically saying, well, you can create the same product cheaper while we have to abide by standards and regulations and we can't compete. Now, take into account that the Ukrainians do ask money for their stuff. But now imagine that it would be absolutely free. I mean, imagine just like free grain comes from Ukraine into Romania. I mean, that would devastate our farmers, right? So, so this is the solution of the Mexico's president proposal, right? Just, just give them money, give them cash, bribe them so that they don't break the law and, and come here. And the thing is, like, you're not giving money to the actual person that's coming into the United States. You're, you're giving money, again, to the politicians, to the bureaucrats, and maybe hopefully something trickles down. Uh, then it's like lifting sanctions on Venezuela and, and the Cuban embargo. Now, now this one is very interesting, right? Because you see a lot of Americans constantly saying how unfair the United States is to Venezuela, Cuba, and many other communist nations. Um, if you look at what Soviet Union did, and this is true with almost every single communist nation in history, the first thing they did, even, even the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, like even Chaz in the United States when they created their little occupation, the first thing they do is they lock down the borders. Very strict, incredibly strict border control. Now, now the Soviets created the world's largest open prison, as people like to call Gaza. The Soviets did that. It was bigger than Gaza. If you're in Romania, you couldn't leave your country without approval from the government. And, and they would only allow you to leave to other communist nations. Like, like if you're a Romanian citizen and you wanted to visit Britain... It was next to impossible. Like, like the only way you could have done it is if you were a famous athlete and the next Olympics were held in London. Or, or if you managed to, to get a job as a, a, a security service agent and you were guarding the president as he went to London. But other than that, it was illegal for a Romanian to go to London. Like, like this is what the communist nations do. They, they lock people in. 
and they prevent all interaction from the outside. So no American publication, no American talking point, nothing can get into the Iron Dome, the, the Iron Curtain, sorry. Now, they also complain, it's like, well, why, why are the Americans doing, you know, blocking us? Because they have this thing called active measures. You can find them on Wikipedia. Active measures was what communists tried to do in order to subvert the American system. Uh, we call it woke nowadays because, like, the people from the academia looked at the active measures and they really like how you can destabilize and demoralize people. And it's like, well, you know, why don't we do it? Uh, you don't want people to be united against the elites. You don't want people to be united against the establishment. They call that populism and it's horrible, right? So, so you use various ideologies to demoralize the people, to get the people to fight amongst themselves. It's what prison guards do to prisoners, by the way. So the active measures, how were they done? Well, you had like Russian journalists, reporters, uh, students, university professors, like, like all of that would go to the target country and start doing the demoralization process over there. And, and over time, the people became more sympathetic towards communism. You, you had more agitators, you had more pro-communist groups. Um, and, and America noticed that and was like, okay, well, we're going to put embargo. Like, you, we're, we're going to add sanctions to your countries. You, we're not going to fund you with money. We're not, right? Um, now, apparently, the Mexican president would want to, to lift those sanctions. Um, with Venezuela, I, I do think that America may consider lifting them simply because, like, if they're not going to do business with uh, the Russians for obvious reasons regarding gas imports and stuff, I, I can see them, like, restrict uh, lifting the sanctions on Venezuela. Cuba, not so much, because many Cubans uh, went to Florida and voted for DeSantis, and that is something that the Democrats can't tolerate. They like diversity, but this is too much. Uh, legalized law-abiding Mexicans living in the United States. Now, now, this is one that I love the most, right? Because um, the left constantly assures, it's like, immigrants can't vote. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Relax, chill out. Don't worry about it. They can't vote. Uh, sure, they can't vote, but they can do agitation, they can do propaganda, they, they can spread the political message, and when they have kids. But uh, now it's like, no, actually, you know, just give them the right to vote. Now, now here's the interesting part, because like, you notice this in human history. Um, especially people who leave a country, they, they still have sympathies for that country. Like, I have many people from Romania that are now living in the European Union. So they're living in Germany, they're living in Britain, they're living in Spain. If push comes to shove, it, 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 like, which interests do you think they would care more about? Like, like if it was a conflict, a hypothetical one between Germany and Romania, which side do you think they will have? And I'm not talking about like military conflict, but like economic conflict, you know, like... Uh, uh, certain frictions, in fact, in fact, we, we get to see it today with Palestine, right? Like you have all these um, <clears throat> uh, groups of people that have come from the Middle East and they settled in Europe. Uh, uh, have they adopted European values when the conflict between Israel and Palestine happened? No, like the politicians were horrified. I mean, especially in London, they're, they're still dealing with the backlash because everyone is supporting Palestine. And they're like, well, why is this happening? Well, it's because you just because people have moved across the land just because they traveled thousands of kilometers to get here, it doesn't mean that they left behind all of their culture, uh, cultural traditions and way of thinking and heritage and everything like that, and they just became British by, by simply moving over the border. No, they, they still have sympathies towards their place of birth. I mean, if you were to live your city, not your country, just your city, and you had like a decent and nice childhood, you would still have sympathies towards the city you grew up in, simply due to nostalgic reasons. So basically, if they were to have the right to vote, any type of legislation that favors Mexico in any way, shape, or form, they will support that. They will support politicians that promote more aid to Mexico. more. Because like at the end of the day, you got to wonder, why is the Mexican president supporting this? Like, why, What is his interest? Why does he want his people to move away from his nation? It doesn't make sense, right? Like When I look at Romania... One of the big problems that we have is that all the doctors, lawyers, and engineers are leaving the country. It's called a brain drain. It's pretty bad. Especially when you wonder, like, who's going to pay for my pension, right? So why is the Mexican president happy that his people are leaving? When it's his job, it's his duty to make sure that the people are happy in Mexico. Like, he should want Americans to come into Mexico. He should want it the other way around. He should want Mexico to be such an amazing country that even people from the United States, and there are certain states 
where you can say that, well, life is actually worse here than it is in certain parts of Mexico. Why doesn't he try to make it like that? The, the answer is because this is a form of soft power. This is a form of, like, getting people in, into another country so that they vote in your favor. And in order to do that, they need to have the right to vote, which is why he wants to legalize law-abiding Mexicans living in the U.S. So, so in other words, in order to stop uh, the immigration, uh, just give immigrant citizenship and, and give money to Latin America and the Caribbean. I mean, I, I, you know, like this is the worst type of deal you can ever possibly get. And the interesting thing is that I, I, I'm genuinely thinking that the Democrats are considering it. Like they, they may say, hmm, like this is, yeah, no, like th this sounds like a good idea. It's kind of like, uh, hey, you know, if you don't want crime, like you want to fix crime, just change the definition of the word criminal. You know, legalize crime and then all of a sudden the crime rates drop. Because this is literally what he's asking for, right? Oh, you don't want immigration? Then legalize law-abiding Mexicans living in the U.S. So now immigrants become citizens and you don't have more problem with an immigration. Let me know what you guys think. And as usual, I will see you in the comment section. Take care.